just a reminder, Trina was the Educational Foundation. I have to be at another presentation shortly, so I wanted to make sure before I leave today, I'm going to leave some pamphlets of information. It has my contact information in there. As the foundation, we have just kicked off our new fundraising campaign for this year. So I know the Men's Garden Club, we appreciate your collective support of Blue Ridge and our horticulture program. But in the event any of you feel led personally to have a journey with the foundation in whatever respect, I'd love to have that conversation. So I just wanted to make sure while I was here today, you had a way to reach me after the meeting um, and just look forward to getting to know all of you over the coming years. So thank you for having us today. Okay, I am going to go through this relatively quickly because I do feel like some of the subject matter is going to be something you are all already familiar with on some level. Um, and I also know that we have another event starting and I want to leave enough time for questions. So, um, we're obviously talking about native plants and the landscape. So first off, what makes a native a native? This is actually a more contentious question than you might think. Um, when would we say a plant is native, right? Is it from when it arrived here in the Industrial Revolution, or does it have to have gotten here at the last ice age? Is it native to the southeast? Is it native to this county? Um, in some ways, the way that for ecological gardeners, you would say it's whatever plant is ecologically significant, right? So if that plant contributes to the ecosystem, meaning birds can eat it, insects can eat it, it is adapted to our environment, that on some level is the functional definition of a native. That will be disputed depending on who you are talking to, absolutely, right? Um, and in the moment we find ourselves, it is probably even more hotly contested than normal as our awareness of natives and how important they are becomes something. But as of today, what I'm going to call a native is something that is ecologically significant, right? That it contrib contributes to the functionality of the ecosystem that is your garden and the greater ecosystem it finds itself in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Okay. So the benefits of natives. The hands down biggest one is that it supports our insect and bird communities. Between the 1970s and now, we apparently have been losing one out of every four birds that are insectivorous or seed eaters. That means a 30% decline in the birds in our ecosystems around us. And I know even I, at 42, have noticed a decline in birds around us. And even insects, which is the reason the birds are declining. Because birds, I mean, I'm going to forget that number because it's not in my head right now, but the number of insects that a bird needs to eat in order to get to adulthood and then to survive as a healthy bird is shocking, right? It's one of those numbers where it's like every bird has to eat something like two pounds of caterpillars a day or something like that. And if they're raising offspring, that means they have to collect even more. And if they have to fly further for them, they're not finding them, they're wasting energy. It is a huge deal. And I know I notice just driving around, there aren't as many insects on my windshield. There aren't as many insects I'm dealing with and that is a real problem. Um, we, in our culture, tend to have very different ideas of what our threshold levels are for damage in our landscapes, right? We want them to look very perfect and immaculate. Even if it's not gonna kill the plant, a lot of times we don't want them to have been nibbled on, right? We don't wanna see galls on things, but those are exactly the things that mean the insects are living and thriving. It's not gonna kill the plant, I mean, it, it, another amazing thing about plants is they can lose something most of the time of like 70 or 80% of their body mass and not die, right? They are evolved to handle it, to be eaten by insects who then chew all that stuff up, poop it out, and compost down below them, and then everybody continues functioning how they're supposed to. Birds eat their seeds, spread them in the world. This is all how it is supposed to happen. But we have started to see landscapes needing to be these perfectly smooth, nothing is going wrong, and ecologically speaking, that is a desert, right? Perfectly manicured lawns with boxwood hedges and nandinas is ecologically a desert. There's very little alive in that ecosystem other than the individual plants themselves. No insects, very few birds unless you're feeding them bird seed, all of those sorts of things. So that's the biggest one with natives, right? If that isn't something that is 
well, something that is what you want in your landscape, some of the other reasons they're really great is they tend to have less maintenance. When you have natives in your landscape, they are going to survive better in this ecosystem. You don't have to fight as hard. You don't have to spray them with as much stuff. You don't have to prune them as much. You are trying to coddle them into being this very specific thing. So they tend to just live how they're supposed to live. They spread and flourish, and they tend to have a little bit more variety and all that sort of thing. So you just have to put a little bit less effort into a native landscape than you are for a plant that we're forcing to live in this landscape, right? So, um, next on my fun list, um, natives support a absolutely amazing array of dependent organisms, right? I think probably the poster child for this is the monarchs. Monarchs get the most press um, because we can see them, they go to that place in Mexico and they're very dramatic, right? But there's also the spicebush swallowtail and the pipevine swallowtail and the blueberry bee and all of these organisms that need very specific native plants to either lay their eggs on or eat at a certain point in their life cycle. Um, a lot of our solitary bees and smaller little wasps that we don't always think about but are really important they overwinter by laying their eggs inside hollow stems of certain types of plants. And if they don't have those hollow stems in which to lay their overwintering generation, then they won't make it into springtime. And if we cut back all of that plant matter and either burn it or compost it instead of either leaving it standing till springtime or at least piling it in the back of the garden somewhere, then again, that next generation doesn't hatch out in the springtime which means every single season we're just slowly chipping away at all of these dependent organisms that require all of these sort of things. And some of our coolest plants like orchids and things, our native orchids, they have some very elaborate interactive uh, pollination strategies. Um, most orchids don't have an endosperm in their seed, meaning they can't actually germinate and survive without an interactive relationship with a fungus. So at the moment of germination, they have to immediately make contact with certain funguses in the soil, which means you need an active, robust, varied soil structure with fungus and bacteria and all those little critters down in there. Otherwise, they just won't grow because they didn't come with their own endosperm. They're one of our more ancient species, so all those beautiful lady slippers, all of those amazing world pagonias and those really amazing lady tresses and everything that we see in our forest and that can grow in your garden, if you, again, don't have an ecologically based soil and you don't have all of these things that contribute to that, then, then you won't have those things in your garden and we start losing them even in forest settings, really. So non-natives, there is a difference between a non-native and an invasive, right? You can have non-native plants and the experts that are out there writing about this and doing a lot of research say that if you can try and have anywhere from 60 to 70 percent natives, that other bit of non-natives is okay. So if you want a Japanese maple in your garden, by all means, have a Japanese maple in your garden. But maybe you could not have a barberry or a Bradford pear, right? Those are plants that become invasive. They have seeds that survive. They are now spreading into our forests. Um, uh, autumn olives, eleagnus, all of those sort of things, that is a big difference, right? You can have plants here that are well behaved. They don't take over things, they don't attack the water systems, and I feel like a couple states around us, I feel like Virginia in particular, just outlawed barberries. It's now illegal to have them. I mean, if you already have them in your garden, I don't think they're making you rip them off. However, you can't bring them in anymore, right? You can't cross state lines with them because they're finding them more and more out in the forest. And the big problem with those, it seems like there's something that's in the ecosystem, but a lot of those plants, so Nandina is a big one for this, even though it's making a berry, our native birds will not eat those berries, right? I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you have a Nandina in your yard, the berries are still there. The reason the berries are still there is because the birds don't want those, right? Say again? They're poisonous. Right, they're poisonous, and so they just don't touch them. And there are some things they will, like obviously an autumn olive they will, 
But then that is going out there and it's pollinating with some of our native heliagnus and it's running them out and it's making all these cross pollinations that mean that they aren't, our straight species natives are no longer functioning like they're supposed to. So it can be a little bit of a process, right, to understand which ones are really the noxious invasives and which are just the non-natives. And I think probably the added challenge sometimes is when does it switch? Because for a long time we had Bradford pears and they're not a problem, but now there's a few states that offer bounties on Bradford pears at the extension office. If you bring in a Bradford pear, like you brought in the trunk and you show that you removed it from the landscape, they give you a reward for that. Because they again are cross-pollinating, but Bradford pears are sterile. So when they cross-pollinate with all of our other trees that are out there that are similar to them, those flowers do not produce fruits anymore, or at least not that season, which means, again, we're robbing the birds of a meal source that they don't get anymore. And again, it can be challenging, but I think mostly what I want to say with this slide is like, you can have some of those plants you want, right? You don't have to feel like you are doing something wrong by not having only natives in the landscape. That is certainly not what I'm here to say by any means, but there's like, you know, the, the top 10 that you could maybe focus on is like, these are the ones that are really causing problems. We really need to keep out of our landscapes because they're spreading into the forest and they are shoving out our native species as opposed to something that calmly stays in your yard and does what it's supposed to, right? Okay, so then this is a new term that has started to appear. Has anybody heard this term, a native var? <clears throat> a couple of y'all. So a native var is a portmanteau word, right, that's native and cultivar. So for anybody who's ever seen like an autumn sunset echinacea, those things are stunning, right? They're so beautiful. They're in these sort of, you know, they start out yellow in the middle and then fade out to these bright reds and stuff like that. So while echinacea is native, Autumn sunset echinacea is not a native, it is a cultivar, but it still can be ecologically significant. It can be difficult to tell which of those can be really helpful though, because sometimes these plants have been bred to not have pollen, to not have some of the things that we think of as messy in a garden setting, and then sometimes it's inadvertent. Right, you're doing a breeding program and really what our goal here is to get something is this color and inadvertently getting that color, we eliminate this other ecological benefit of this plant because we're focused on this one genetic trait and then we forget the other one. So native ours is again one of those things that you're going to see a, a lot of mixed opinions if you look into this subject. Some of them very strong, right, about whether or not where these fall in that category. And a lot of it again has to it depends on, do they make seeds? Do they make pollen? Are they ecologically significant? Or do they not contribute to the landscape in some way, form, or fashion? And there's actually a lot of research going on in this. My uh, alma mater, Auburn, they do a lot of this sort of research, right? So they'll plant out five different varieties and a straight species, and then some poor grad student has to sit out there for like five hours a day and just count which ones the insects land on. Right? How much pollen do they fly away with once they land on that insect and just right, sit there staring at plants all day? Okay, so like I already said, why not both? Right? Just because you want some things that are native doesn't mean you can't have some non-natives as long as they're not invasive and make a little blend. If we're aiming, and maybe, yeah, 60, 70 is the goal, but if you're at 40 or 50, believe me, that is still better than track housing with nothing but box hedges and grasses that the insects can't eat that are being heavily chemically managed. And again, our, nothing is living there. If you look in the soil, the soil go down, goes down that far, and there's absolutely nothing whatsoever living in there. And unless you're feeding the birds uh, seed, which for some birds is like, they're not really getting any of the proteins and nutrients that they need from insects, right? They get a very different diet when they're eating insects versus straight seeds. Some birds are straight seed eaters, but a lot of our birds are insectivorous. And if they're not getting insects, they're not eating a balanced diet and they're not healthy. Their eggshells come out too thin, which I feel like anybody who was around, I, I, they teach it less and less now, but like that's why A Silent Spring was written was because Rachel Carson became aware that DDT was making eggs smaller, which means all the birds were dying. And that's kind of what happens also when birds don't get enough of those insects that have 
exoskeletons and chitons and all of those things that contribute to a truly healthy reproductive population of bird life in our ecosystems. Okay, I am, by the way, going to send this PowerPoint out to all of you, so don't feel like you have to try and memorize some of these, right? Um, this slide, when it gets closer to you, you can read all these, are some of the alternatives I offer when I'm asked about some of these, right? On the left are some of our more noxious plants in a landscape, or some of the ones that, again, are very non-supportive of life. And on the right are going to be things you could use instead, right? And what I really encourage people to do when I am giving them these kinds of alternatives or discussing with them is to try and think about what it is you really want, right? If what do you think you want is a Nandina, well, why do you want a Nandina? Is it because it's evergreen? Is it because it has berries? Is it because it has a color? Well, if it's one of those, we can find something that has that thing, right? If you just know you want an Andina, I mean, I guess, but there is going to be something that has berries. There is something that has beautiful fall color. There is something that is evergreen, that is a native, that you can use as an alternative. And I think it's easy to be presented with the things on the left because they're easy to find. They're in every nursery out there, and they're the thing that we have all learned, even I as a landscape professional, this is the thing you do. This is the thing you use in this setting, right? But again, why am I using this in this setting? Am I hedging something? Do I want this because it's a screen between me and my neighbors? Do I want something that's exactly 10 feet tall? Well, again, if that's my goal, it doesn't have to be this plant. It could be this plant instead, right? And then you have something that's doing exactly what you want that is also supporting the ecosystem around you and contributing to the insect and bird life that's around us. All right, so the next few are just some of my favorites. Again, y'all are going to get this, so um, some of you, of course, are going to know. Um, there are native maples versus non, right? So some of them are not going to be as good for, again, each ecological significance. Uh, the picture I have up here is of a yellowwood tree. I, thank you, thank you, Ray. I love yellowwood trees. I think they are so stunning. They make these beautiful, long flowers. They have a compound leaf, kind of like a hickory. They get pretty large, they're relatively fast growing, um, just really beautiful trees. We have some big, huge ones in our area, and this is tall trees. Um, I know this time of year, the sourwoods are one of my favorite fall color trees. They are turning that absolutely unbelievable red right now. Some of them still have those beautiful raceme flowers that are kind of tipping out of their leaf pattern like that, and just beautiful. They have amazing bark too. So I feel like even in the winter, a sourwood tree has significance in your landscape. Just absolutely beautiful and a huge food source for any of our pollinators this time of year. Right, when a lot of other stuff is wrapping it up, those sourwoods are putting on just a mass pollen dump that all of our pollinators get a really good meal right before they go through their winter dormancy. Let's see, what else do I have on here? Um, I'm a huge fan of buckeyes too. I think buckeyes are really beautiful. I think they get overlooked because um, we mostly see them in the wild or we think of them as a shrub tree, but they grow really, really fast. I feel like that's one of the ones when somebody says, I want a fast growing tree, what about a buckeye? They get great flowers. They make excellent shade trees. You can make a multi-stem or single stem. Um, they make more babies pretty readily. So if like you don't mind digging up baby seedlings and moving them where you want them, by planting one tree, you get a whole bunch of trees. So much fun. Okay, small trees. Um, picture on here is a pawpaw tree. I think pawpaw trees make amazing shade trees. Big, huge leaves, yes, and they kind of like, they look like this all the time, right? They kind of droop like that, so you can always see their big, flat leaves. And underneath, it's like complete blackout when you're under there in terms of shade. Just really amazing. Um, unusual flower, they have a dark flower that smells kind of funny because they are beetle and fly pollinated, not bee or butterfly pollinated. And of course they make that fruit, right? Who's here gotten a taste of pawpaw? Nice. I really atypical, and it's like you're bringing a tropical into our world, right? If you want a garden that looks and feels a little bit tropical, pawpaw is the way to go, right? They grow a little bit slow. But once they're there and once they're established, they're absolutely amazing. And they make lots of babies again. They put out a lot, right? They put out so many runners. 
that if anything, you have to make more of an effort to like mow over them or deal with those runners, or you can give them away to your friends because they are incredibly easy to root divide and you end up with a whole bunch of the fall balls all over the place. Um, let's see, uh, smoke tree and fringe tree are two of the ones that I tell people when they say they want a uh, mimosa tree, right? You might not. Sassafras, persimmon, sumac, surface berry, all things you also get to eat. And I know I personally still, I mean, like, I was one of those kids that actually went to the hospital a couple of times for eating things in the wild until I honed my skills professionally. And I still love to eat things off of a tree. I just think it is so fun to walk out into my yard and eat something that morning as I'm wandering around in my garden and looking at things. And those are some of our, again, favorites of our birds and insects. There are so many that live off of those. And for anybody who's never eaten a sumac berry, they are absolutely amazing. And sumac is actually a really valuable spice in sort of Lebanese cooking. It's got this real lemony tart flavor that is fantastic. I would encourage anybody to go out there and try and find some sumac. It's <clears throat> berries are out right now and it's really delicious. And poison sumac is the only one that has white berries. So as long as you don't eat one with white berries, you're not gonna get poison. You gotta do the ones with red berries. Very obvious, staghorn ones have the ones that stick straight up in the air. Right now they look like these cones on the side of the road. Really delicious. Um, the Latin name is Roos radicans. And uh, growing up, I grew up in South Louisiana and we have a lot of it and we used to call it Roos juice. And you make this lemonade drink by cold soaking sumac berries and add a little bit of honey and it makes this lemonade beverage that is just absolutely incredible. Yeah, Roos juice. Okay, shrubs, this was a hard list to even try and narrow down. There are so many native shrubs, right? We have really wonderful tree cover, but all of that secondary growth in our ecosystems is all of these amazing shrubs. And we do have some evergreen ones, right? So if you want an evergreen hedge, mountain laurel, inkberry, some of the hollies that are evergreens, throw in some bottle brush buckeyes so they're gonna get really full during the growing season, um, maybe one of those red cedars, and then you're going to prune it effectively so it's not a single trunk, it's multi-trunk. All of those really great berries come in, and again, you end up with this beautiful mixed hedge that is so useful on so many levels, both for you and again, all of the wildlife that lives around you. And I feel like this was way more common when it was uh, something that you built a fence out of, sort of, right? Like, the um, hawthorn hedges that they have in the UK is very much this, right? Where you weave these things together and then it becomes this living ecosystem all in and of itself because there's so many creatures that live in there and nest in there and eat in there and do all these wonderful things. So you can have a permanent hedge still using natives and then you can have all these beautiful blooms also. Uh, the picture we have up here is a nine bark. Nine bark is one of my absolute favorites. I think nine barks are so beautiful. Uh, we didn't really have them where I grew up, and it's one of those ones that I am still just enamored with having moved up here. They make those really beautiful kind of blackberry little bundle flowers like that. And again, come in great colors. They get real big. They have those beautiful kind of arrowhead shaped leaves. Just stunning. I mean, it, it, again, it's one of my absolute favorite shrubs now that I live up here. Um, oak leaf hydrangeas is another one in that category. I mean, the fall color you get out of an oak leaf hydrangea, again, it's almost unparalleled. And those big, huge leaves, just really, really beautiful. And of course, we've got our vines. We have some pretty amazing vines. The one I have pictures of is the uh, Dutchman's Pipe. So Dutchman's Pipe, that's its flower. And then it gets very large, big old, huge, heart safe leaves. And then the, the pipeline swallowtail has to have this vine in order to lay its offspring. It'll eat from other things, but this is its dependent species. It has to have these, or else it's not gonna be able to function and it will continue to diminish in our ecosystems. We have several in that category. Um, right now, the native clematis, or the virgin's bower, is blooming pretty effectively, and then it makes those really cool puffy seed pods all over the place that our birds love so much. Um, and Virginia creeper, if anybody's planting something that is gonna creep around, I would please encourage you to use Virginia creeper and not English ivy. English ivy can make a very effective ground cover, but it will kill trees and it spreads everywhere and it is impossible to kill. As a landscaper, I don't know how many frustrating hours I have spent trying to remove and eradicate English ivy, which is obviously part of the reason we love it when it's in the place where we want it, but you're just gonna get more from Virginia creeper. It makes berries, it changes color, it's still really good at what it does, a little bit different, but again, you can mix it in with other things, 
and it is just going to be better for everything around than English IV, really. Um, a few of our ferns, we do have several, several native ferns. The uh, ebony spleenwort that's shown right here is another one I find so beautiful. It's the one that has the really black stems. So when you're up close, it just looks so feathery and those really dark black stems are under there. So with a, a mossy background, the stems get really dramatic and they really become a part of the visual appeal of that. Um, some of our ferns require more boggy habitat, so like cinnamon fern or something like that. If you have a damp area at your house, which I feel like a lot of us do around here, a lot of these are good for sort of a rain garden setting, right? Maidenhair fern, cinnamon fern, some of those really big dramatic ones. I think cinnamon fern looks sort of prehistoric, right? It's got those huge plumes, it's got that big uh, flower spiky thing that comes up that's that dark cinnamon color, which is where it gets its name. So we do have all kinds of ferns you can use instead of, again, the ones that are not native. And there are things that eat these and live on these, and they will spread happily wherever you put them. Grasses and sedges, this is a tough one because there are so many pretty grasses out there, but we do have several native ones. I think the river oats, picture at the top left, is one of the prettiest grasses hands down, whether it's native or not. It makes so much movement, right? All its little seed heads kind of hang over and they wave in the wind and they just add a huge amount of beauty, I think, to um, both the summer garden when they're in their soft green color, but then winter interest in a garden, if you're trying to have a four season garden, they are absolutely amazing to add in. Um, pink muley grass is as dramatic as any of the non-natives you're ever gonna find. Who here has seen some pink muley grass? I feel like more and more we have it. Uh, this big around, almost hot pink. It's real fluffy looking too. I mean, it's just absolutely stunning in a landscape when the light is coming through it. Again, in a mixed border, um, and it lasts through. So again, for a four season garden, any of these are great. The thing on the bottom right, that's the Pennsylvania sedge. So instead of a lawn, if you're not gonna walk on your lawn, which don't get me wrong, I am all for lawns if you are using it for dramatic effect, or if you have grandkids or kids or something that wants to play on that lawn, but two acres of lawn that nobody ever walks on, I have to admit that I regularly try and talk people out of that, right? It is, again, a desert that requires a lot of fuel and chemical input to maintain at that level. Um, cool season grasses are the best for us, and Augustine is hands down the most survivable. Right, in terms of what's going to be here and require the least amount of input. But if you have somewhere like this, that's on the edge of something, that all you want it to be is constantly green, some of the sedges are amazing. They're not only possible to kill, they spread really effectively, they look really beautiful, they have this beautiful furry look, all sorts of stuff lives under there. So all sorts of great beetles and worms and little lizards and toads and frogs that also eat some of the things you don't want. All of that's making a habitat under all of that great area under those sedges. So Pennsylvania sedge is another one that I feel like I recommend pretty regularly when people want green space, but are otherwise not going to play on it or do something else on it. Ground covers, I will admit, are tough, right? We don't have many ground covers that are quite as effective as some of the ones that are out there and are really good at what they do, which is part of what makes them invasive, right? I would say green and gold, which is what I have a picture of here, is probably one of my favorite. Chrysogonium, it makes these beautiful yellow flowers. Pollinators love it. It spreads really readily. Um, all the other stuff, sure, it's, it can be a ground cover. Maybe creeping flocks is probably the next best thing, but I will admit ground covers can be difficult, which, you know, for better or worse, we have a few of them, but Perennials are probably going to be better in a garden setting where you're using natives, right? Which brings us to the last few. Um, this is where it's another one kind of like shrubs. We just have such a wonderful collection of sun-loving perennials around here. I chose a picture of the Lobelia cardinalis, the big cardinal flower. Another one of my absolute favorites. It is so dramatic. It's so beautiful. Everything loves it. Birds, uh, hummingbirds, bees, every single thing that eats this kind of thing is going to eat Lobelias. They spread really fast and easy. Um, they prefer a little bit of a damp setting, which is, again, is something I feel like a lot of us have in this ecosystem. Um, I feel like probably most of y'all have seen these. They are coming up with more and more, again, native bar varieties of things like Joe Pye weed and ironweed, so that they're this tall instead of this tall, right? So they're more manageable in your garden. And 
the North Carolina Arboretum, I feel like, has a particularly good collection these days of some of these native bars that they will recommend again. So you can have a Joe Pye in your garden, which the butterflies just flock to, but I know at my house in the big meadow, those things are like 14 feet tall. I mean, they just do not work at a you know, regular garden setting because they get enormous and they're just so big. So there are some ones more and more that are of a size that is manageable and you can put them in a regular garden setting. And then, of course, we have all our shade lovers. Um, we also have an amazing collection of these because we have so much shade, right? Um, the one I chose is one that I feel like gets forgotten or is a little atypical. This is all a woods poppy or a celandine poppy. Bright, bright yellow. They bloom all the way throughout summer. So if what you want is some color in your shade garden in the summer, which is really hard to get, this is your go-to, right? And it spreads really well. Once you have it in your garden, if you give it a spot to spread, it is so good at taking over an area and making this really dramatic yellow effect, even in shady locations, right? Um, all the rest of them, what tends to happen with ours is a lot of our shade lovers are, um, they take advantage of that moment in springtime when the soil is warm enough but the trees haven't leafed out. So we call them spring ephemerals, right? So they blast up first thing in spring, they bloom, make flowers, do everything in like two and a half weeks, and then the leaves come over and then they just kind of disappear again. And they go back to just being the green darkness because the shade is over them and they aren't photosynthesizing anymore. So trilliums, bloodroots, trout lilies, jack in the pulpits, all of that stuff, that's them, right? Come up right in the springtime, pretty dramatic, they go back to being green. Whereas again, a celadine poppy, these are going to make great flowers throughout. Um, jewelweed is another one I think people forget about. It does get pretty big and it does like damp feet, but those flowers are so beautiful and they spread really well. So again, you don't have to fight with them to get them to stay alive. And it's the natural, rem natural remedy for poison ivy. So if anybody's super sensitive to poison ivy or have somebody in your life who is, um, I have a really close friend who can get poison ivy just by looking at it. And she harvests jewelweed and grinds it up and freezes it in ice cube trays, then pops it out and saves them in a Ziploc bag. So she just has to go and get one of those. And I mean, she still washes with Dawn dish soap to get all that urosol oil off her as much as possible. But then she has one of those little ice cubes of jewelweed to rub on her arm for the next few days to make sure that she doesn't get it and definitely helps make the itchiness go away. So again, you get all these really great things just by using some native plants. Okay, um, again, you're going to get this, but I know one of the other challenges with natives is where do you find them, right? When you go to your average nursery, they don't have celandine poppy. They, that's just not something they're going to carry because the average uninformed consumer, which is not you all, isn't even going to ask for it. So why would they have it? Why would they stock it? Um, some of them it's easier to start from seed, but all of these are nurseries in our area that carry natives specifically. Right? They're going to have some atypical stuff. If you ask them for something, they're more likely to help you find it. Um, the internet, of course, is where everything comes from these days. And like it or not, and whatever else it might have challenges with, if you want to find something, the internet has it somewhere. Um, even native plants can be useful for that. I would say be more careful with seeds. I tend to discourage people from buying seeds from unregulated sources because you have less of a guarantee that that seed is what they say it is isn't four years old, has regular germination percentages attached to it, that kind of thing. So you have to be a little more careful about that kind of thing. But like full trees, that kind of thing, it's a little harder to fake that. And so you do tend to get something that's a little more secure when you're shopping those. But again, these are our locals that are going to produce that. And with that, I will open this up to questions. Yeah, right here. Yes, yeah, so if my rose bushes are getting eaten up, that means they probably have a fairly healthy pop insect population. Very. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, and you know, I think there can also be some seasonality in choosing when you allow insects access to your plants, right? So first thing in the spring, and when they're actively blooming through summer, sure, you can keep the insects off of more because that's when they are at their peak visible, uh, of visual appeal, right? But by this time of year, they're done. You're going to start pruning them back in a few months, right? All of that's going to start happening, so why not? They can eat that, right? And again, it's not going to hurt your rose. The rose is definitely not going to die. And so, as of right now, you're just providing a meal to a very hungry population. Yep. And I would say diseases are different, right? If you're talking about a rose and it's getting fungal diseases, 
a fungal disease is a little different than an insect, right? Diseases are more likely to potentially actually kill a plant. Yeah. Insects, it's way less likely that they're actually going to eat it to death. I mean, there are a few, but it's less likely. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, two questions. One is, you didn't want to the large trees. Sure. Uh, just because I was trying to focus more on ones that maybe don't get as much play, airtime, right? I feel like most people know about oak trees. I also didn't put tulip magnolias, right? I mean, th there's so many. I couldn't even, I, I can't even list them all. Oh, which brings me to, if anybody wants any continuing ed, I am still a total hard copy book person. I really love this one, but honestly, any book by Larry Mellishamp, he was the head of the North Carolina Native Plant Society for many years before he passed away. Any of his books are incredibly well written. Um, this one I, is a little smaller, so I carried it around. He's got a couple other ones, though. He was really into carnivorous plants, so he has some great books on carnivorous plants and how to keep them alive. Um, but I'll have this for anybody who can write it down. Um, but his books in particular have incredible write-ups on each of these plants, what they need, where they're going to work best in the landscape. So yes, I just had to triage which plants to actually put on the slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You were talking about certain varieties of plants. They're really not good for, you know, to create pollen or not food sources. Or is there, is there anybody like speaking to government officials or something to, you know, stop this? You know, I'm sure the big box stores could care less about. Right. Money talks. So is there anybody? Yes, there is. Um, I, I don't know that there is like a single entity that is speaking on a federal level other than say the Forest Service or independent nonprofits and that sort of thing. Um, in North Carolina, we do have the North Carolina Native Plant Society, which just this past year actually got a push through that for any new DOT plantings, they have to choose natives first. That doesn't mean they can't use a non-native if a native is unavailable, but they have to consider <coughs> natives first and potentially use those as much as possible. So yes, there's always a little bit of effort. And I think that, um, has anybody here heard of Doug Tallamy? Um, he wrote a book not too long ago called Bringing Nature Home. They made a pretty big splash nationally. I would say it was comparable to something like A Silent Spring with, again, the big argument being that we are devastating our insect and bird populations right now, whether we realize it or not. And it has really been a catalyst, I would say, on some level, in that sometimes what you need is data, right? It's one thing to go out there as a concerned citizen and be like, I think native plants are great and we should use them. And then it's a whole other thing to be able to walk into some sort of legislative session and say, here is the data on how much visitation we get on these plants with insects. Here's how many insects we're losing every single year and be able to present that data. And that is in a large part what changes things or changes people's minds because it's harder to ignore, really. And more and more, due to public opinion, because everything is swinging back and forth, right, more and more universities are doing that kind of research, which means you have more and more ammo. So, yeah, it feels like a pendulum kind of swinging a little bit. Maybe not fast, but it is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing is getting cut back until that first warm flush in the springtime when you see those first clouds of insects, right? But I understand that that's not always reasonable. So when you want to prune, either for the plant's health, the visual appeal, or the look of your garden, if you cannot burn or destroy that plant matter, but you can find somewhere to just pile it, then they can still hatch out in springtime. Right, because again, that's the big thing that's happening about this time of year. They're trying to all get a good meal, then they're going to lay eggs, or they're going to put larvae in the soil, and that is how things overwinter. Right, most insects don't live through the winter. And so if you can just not destroy that plant matter, that's the most important thing. Right? Hold true for anything, like the rubesia and all the stuff that was 
absolutely. If you ever snap any of those Rubecchia echinacea stems, they're perfectly hollow in the middle. And what those insects like to do is chew out that pit, and then they lay all those in eggs inside of there with like a paralyzed spider or a paralyzed aphid or something. And then when those little larvae hatch out, they have alive food, and then they drill their way out of those uh, out of those stems, and that's the first generation in the springtime. So yes, that's true of many, many things, right? Both woody species, perennial species. We're here. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And presentation.